Well, welcome. I'm Karen Launchbaugh. I'm director of the Rangeland Center here at the University of Idaho. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Courtney Conway, and he is the director of the Idaho Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit here at the University of Idaho. And uh, a few years ago, we got interested in a topic. I'm a grazing land ecologist. And uh, of course, uh, there's concern and interest in sage grouse and, uh, and livestock grazing is one of, one of those topics. So uh, Courtney and I started working together and looking at the effects of grazing on, on grouse. Right, so in for 2014, we decided to put together a team of scientists and managers that would work with us to design a rigorous 10-year study to examine the relationship between cattle grazing and sage grouse demographic traits. And specifically, we are examining the effects of cattle grazing on 11 sage grouse demographic traits, a suite of sage grouse habitat features that we know are important to sage grouse, insect abundance, which is important to the growth of sage grouse chicks, and the abundance of coexisting other bird species that, that coexist with sage grouse. And to do this uh, ambitious project, we've had to enlist a whole suite of partners that have provided uh, financial support and logistic support to make this large project possible. Uh, it includes federal and state agencies, um, industry, and um, non-governmental organizations. Yeah, and we have a planning team uh, that this is not just Courtney and I doing this. We have a, a team of 10 of us that, w that we meet regularly and we talk about how the project is going and whether we're meeting our goals. So the project uh, footprint is we're working at five different study sites throughout southern Idaho. At each one of these study sites, we're measuring those 11 uh, sage grouse demographic traits. We're measuring intensive uh, vegetation parameters, including uh, biomass and grazing uh, intensity, and we're measuring insects abundance and um, uh, abundance of coexisting bird species at each one of these five study sites where we have our grazing uh, treatments replicated. This is a landscape scale uh, experiment uh, with a before after component where we're comparing different grazing treatments. And now we're just going to give you a few of the highlights that we found up through this year. So this is the, we're entering the fifth year of this long-term study. And uh, one of the metrics that we're, we've been measuring is sage grouse nesting success. This is a common metric that's, that's measured uh, by biologists that study sage grouse. And uh, we've, our, the, the results we have so far demonstrate that sage grouse nesting success varies uh, across years and varies between our five study sites. That's not a big surprise. But it, it's, a, it's a reason why we have to evaluate grazing in an experimental context, because all of these demographic traits of sage grouse vary annually, and they vary across space. Another parameter uh, that we're measuring for sage grouse is brood survival, that whether the chicks, uh, after they hatch, whether they survive or not. And that also is a parameter that varies across study sites and across years. But um, the, the estimates that we have so far from, from our study for both nesting success and brood survival are within the range of what's been reported by uh, other study, other past studies of sage grouse. And, and we know from past research on sage grouse that grass height is important because uh, it, it can influence the, how well grouse uh, nests are um, concealed. And also it is something that livestock grazing can influence. So every year we go out and measure uh, thousands and thousands of grasses. We've measured over 100,000 grasses at our research sites. We also measure them in a variety of ways. We measure droop height, which is a measurement that many BLM uh, protocols use, which is just the maximum height. We measure visual obstruction. We measure leaf height. We look to see if the grass is, is grazed or ungrazed and if it's under or between shrubs. So we're really trying to get a sense of what affects grass height and how variable is it. And so in this graph, you can see there's just quite a bit of variation uh, from site to site. So each of those bars is a different site. And of course, some grasses are taller than others. That's not a surprise. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, it, it varies from site to site, which is the tallest grass and, uh, and which of those really is high in any one year. We do also look at year-to-year -year variation because guidelines that are written 
to uh, manage grass height, of course, are static, uh, uh, that they, they don't change from year to year, and yet grass height changes from, a lot from year to year. You can see from this grass that grass height can vary from two to six inches from one year to the next. So again, we know that sometimes grass is more abundant in one year or another, but we're trying to really get a handle on how variable is that and, uh, and how, I, how might we measure that. And of course, we're then relating all of these vegetation metrics to sage grouse demographic traits. So and one of the results we've uh, been able to demonstrate so far is that the percent of, of shrub cover differs between sage grouse nests and random locations within these study pastures. So in other words, sage grouse are seeking out the portions of these pastures that have the highest um, shrub cover because they place their nests under these shrubs and the shrubs act as a concealment um, feature to hide their eggs from predators. Yeah, and so then on that left bar, that smaller bar, we have these random plots of state that we measure every year throughout the pasture to see how, how different are the areas that the grouse are selecting versus the random plots in the landscape. And we've also been doing the same thing with grass height. So the, the relationships between sage grouse nests and grass height differ depending on whether the nests failed or succeeded. So the bar on the left there is again the grass height at random locations within these BLM grazing pastures that we're working on. The, the middle bar is sage grouse nests that failed, that were eaten by a predator. And then the bar on the right are sage grouse nests that were successful. They, they hatched chicks and a predator did not find those eggs. And so as you can see, the grass height across all species combined was pretty uh, similar between random locations and failed nests, but nests that were successful had significantly higher uh, grass height. It was a couple inches higher in the successful nests. And that's a result that has been, uh, similar results like this have been reported in numerous previous studies. And these kinds of results are uh, what has dictated and influenced grazing policy in the West within the sage grouse range. Right, and these are all measurements at a plot. And so now we're, we are trying to look at what's happening at a larger landscape. Right, so that the, the previous slide it was are based on very intensive vegetation plots that, that are at a 15 meter radius circle in a, in a plot. So they're very small scale plots. But if we look at those, our data at a much um, larger spatial scale, we see a very different result. So the, this is the percent nesting success uh, for pastures based on when the last time cows grazed those pastures. So on the far left are pastures that have cows in them in the current spring. So while the sage grouse are nesting. And as you move to the, to the right on this graph, it, it's longer and longer time. There's been a longer and longer period from when, um, when the cows were in those pastures. So the, the percentage of the nests that were successful was actually was higher in the pastures that have current cattle grazing and declined uh, with the amount of time it's been since cattle had been in those pastures. So this um, is in some ways opposite of the previous graph, but it's at a much larger spatial scale. It's at the scale of the pasture. Yeah, and the, and the scale of the pasture, that's where, where land management decisions are made. They're made on sort of pasture scale. So it's, it's kind of a difference in the scale that is from a management versus sort of a science or measurement technique. You put both of those together, it does they do tell a little different story as you hinted to. Right, so this is a, a real head scratcher. That the, the graph on the left would, in, would imply that the grazing has a negative effect on whether sage grouse nests succeed or fail. But the graph on the right, which is at a larger spatial scale, Im implies the opposite, that, that there's, it implies that there's a benefit to having cattle in, in a pasture as far as nesting success is concerned. So these two results from the same study, the same years, are, are, are sending a completely opposite message as far as the relationship between cattle grazing and a single demographic trait, sage grouse nesting success. Right, it's quite interesting. It's important to remember though that these are correlative results. Our study is a 10-year study to, to look at the effects of grazing 
in an experimental context where we have explicit experimental treatments. The results we're presenting here that I'm showing, we're showing here are correlative results. They're not the basis of our experiment because those results are still not ready yet. And that's what's unique about this study. There have been correlative results like this on which management is based, but ours is a fully replicated experimental study. And that's what makes it novel. It's, it's the first of its kind. We also are starting to look at other parts of the landscape besides just uh, just the grouse demographic traits, and so uh, we're also looking at other birds. Right, so we, we received a, a grant from the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to conduct avian point count surveys on all of these pastures as well, because we don't, we don't want to manage our landscapes uh, exclusively for a single species. So we've been doing really thorough uh, point count surveys for all birds in these grazing treatments. And uh, after two years of doing those point count surveys, not so surprisingly, there are some species that um, have higher abundance in, in ungrazed pastures. There's other species that have lower abundance in ungrazed pastures. And there's uh, also a group of species that, that don't show any relationship or any variation with grazing intensity. And I, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're also doing very intensive measurements of, of insect abundance and how that varies among the experimental grazing treatments that we're implementing. And so we're measuring the insects using two different methods, well-known well well known traditional methods. One is pitfall sample, pitfall traps. These measure insect uh, of terrestrial insects, ground-dwelling insects. The other me um, method we're using is sweep nets. So it's a butterfly net where we walk transects and, and sweep the, the vegetation. So this samples the insects that are attached to grass and, and shrubs. You know, and I think this is an interesting part because a lot of people don't realize how important insects are to sage grouse, especially those those young chicks when they're just hatched. It's a pretty important part of their diet. And then, but also the question is, how, how does grazing influence uh, these insects? Right, so we have some preliminary data on that question as well. Again, these are correlated results. They're not from uh, the results of the experiment yet because we're, the study is still in its infancy, but from a correlative standpoint, we have already uh, have some compelling results that insect abundance, insect biomass is higher in grazed pastures compared to rested pastures. So the, the bars on the left in each one of these two plots are in pastures that were grazed in that current uh, calendar year whereas the, the bars on the right are pastures that have not been grazed in that calendar year. So both of these uh, graphs are based on insect samples in the summer and there were substantially higher insect biomass in using both methods in p pastures that had uh, current year grazing. Yeah, and of course we're also looking at the individual species so we know whether it was ants or beetles or other things. So a lot more to come on this topic, I think. I hope that raised perhaps more questions than answers. Uh, we are at the beginning of a study and as you've, you've mentioned, Courtney, it's really important to realize that we are going to be changing where animals graze in which pastures. That's the experimental part of it. Right now we have some interesting correlative, res co uh, correlative results. But uh, I think we're moving to having much stronger uh, results that will be valuable for management and for science. And uh, again, I think the fact that we have a team of people is really important. Right, and that, that team of um, uh, partners has been instrumental in getting support from ranchers that we work with. So the things, one of the things we haven't uh, mentioned yet is that we're this is a landscape scale experiment that moves cows around in a way that creates different grazing treatments. And so to do that, we, ha we have to find ranchers that are willing to allow us to implement the experiments on their leases, on their um, grazing allotments. And so we interact very closely with these ranchers to uh, plan where they're gonna put their cows and when so that we can create these different grazing treatments, including a, a no grazing uh, treatment that, that is com where grazing is completely removed from a pasture. And so we're doing that uh, at each one of those five study sites. And um, it's, it, we've, we're halfway through this study. And so it's really important to the ranchers even to keep the study going. They've invested a lot because they want to know the answers too. And so if we 
uh, don't succeed in seeing the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, if we don't uh, complete this, this long-term experiment, I think the ranchers will be disappointed. Yeah, and the BLM folks that have worked with us, I think it's really the whole community that's, that's around these land management and these permits. So uh, keep, stay tuned, and uh, you can always get, contact us or learn more about the study at our website, which is idahograusegrazing.wordpress.com, or you can write to Range at the University of Idaho. That's range at uidaho.edu, and we'll get back to you. Thanks. Thanks.